I'm Joel Stransky. Welcome to the Rugby Hive. You, you receive. I'm Joel Stransky. Welcome to the Rugby Hive. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> love it. Today's guests are the legendary Joel Stransky and Gareth Rees. Gareth Rees captained Canada 23 times, winning 55 caps and scoring 487 test points. He played in the first four Rugby World Cups, cementing his name in rugby history as the only player to do so. He played professionally for several clubs in his career, including Newport, Wasps and Harlequins, as well as the famous Oxford University team and later represented the prestigious Barbarians. In 2010, Rees was inducted to the World Rugby Hall of Fame. He and fellow inductee Brian Lima of Samoa were the first members from outside traditional playing rugby nations. Joel Stransky is most famous for kicking the winning drop goal against the All Blacks to win the 1995 Rugby World Cup Final. He scored all 15 points for the Springboks, which helped unite a divided South Africa with President Nelson Mandela using the sport of rugby to bring people together. He played 22 times for his country, scoring 240 points. During his career, Stransky was part of the first ever Nantel team to win the Curry Cup. He also played in Italy for a few seasons before representing the Leicester Tigers 73 times in the Premiership, scoring 896 points. His side won the 1996-1997 Pilkington Cup and the 1998-99 Allied Dunbar Premiership. In the 2009 movie Invictus, which tells the amazing story of South Africa's World Cup win, he's portrayed by Clint Eastwood's son, Scott. Since retiring, both Reese and Stransky have become well-known television commentators. In today's episode, we explore their early sporting days, advice for young rugby players, we go through the infamous Battle of Butterasmus, a pool game between Canada and South Africa, which took place 25 years ago. We fast forward to Rugby World Cup 2019, where Canada faced South Africa in a pool game, with Stransky and Reese connecting at the match and sharing a few laughs about 1995. Rugby creates wonderful memories and friendships, so please enjoy episode 10 with legends Joel Skansky and Gareth Reese. He's so dangerous, Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him! Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dallin Stanford and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens International. Back in my playing days, I went head-to-head against Dallin and the USA. For several years, Robin has coached international Sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDowell Rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Hello and welcome to episode number 10. It's a magic number, not only for me personally, as I was fortunate enough to wear number 10 on the HSBC World Rugby 7 Series for the US Eagles, but our guests are two of the best 10s to have ever played the game. Canadian Gareth Reese and South African Joel Stransky. And it was so much fun seeing the return of the brilliant head-to-head series featuring two Quackerburgers instead of a Lone Ranger. Gareth Reese, an unbelievable player in his day, a wonderful personality, a great sense of humor been working with Gola Risi on the Sevens World Series in the commentary booth for a few years now and got a chance to see him at the Canada versus Springboks game in Japan 2019 at the Rugby World Cup and ironically he was sitting next to our other guest Joel Stransky as we called the game for World Rugby and uh, just brilliant to hear them on our podcast talking about their backgrounds, advice for younger players, uh, the insights and memories and Robin one that stands out for us of course was the Battle of Rasmus 1995. It wasn't pretty like your haircut my friend. Yeah, well, it was essentially it was a rugby game and a hockey game broke out. And uh, yeah, some old time, you know, everybody's got a plan. The South Africans had a plan until they got punched in the mouth. But, uh, you know, we miss a little of that Canadian grit. Obviously, ethically, we don't want to we don't want to play dirty in the, in the sandbox. But uh, but the size of some of those Canadian boys matched up well against the South African guys. And uh yeah, I just I think it added to the flavor of that epic competition. And uh, you know, to have Gareth Reese on for me was definitely one of my heroes as a young Canadian and and a young goal kicker coming through. And uh, and for you, I'm sure you looked up to Joel Stransky. So uh, just a bit tickled to have them both on together and and talk about that. It was really not just a historic rugby uh, moment, and we talked about it with Havana as well, but obviously historical for uh, for your great nation of South Africa. 
Yeah, it certainly was, you know, and it was it's so interesting because, you know, th- that that game in particular, most folks thought for South Africa, they were like, okay, you know, they've beaten Australia, who are the defending champions and their other massive teams in their pool. So Canada thought, oh, you know, a couple of lineup changes would be okay. But wow, the way the Canadians came out firing Lepa Risi and them, it really had the whole of South Africa on the edge of their seats. The lights went out the stadium, punches were thrown, red cards came out. It really was all happening. And it was, as you said, it was so great to get their insights, being on the field. And, uh, and Joel even said he got he, he cut his eye because it was Reese or somebody came in with a little swinging high five. So it was all happening. And just just great to hear the, from these guys themselves. One of my highlights is just talk to Reese sharing some stories uh, behind the scenes, like on tour, what it was like to be a, a Canadian World Cup team, just, you know, being amongst it in at that time, that historical time again. So, uh, you know, again, we often don't talk about the actual on field. It's, it's all about the off field. And uh, yeah, these two legends, it's pretty cool full circle that now they're commentators on the world series together. And they, uh, they obviously used to literally smash heads. So. That's right. Now, speaking of on field action, I believe McDool rugby is back in the mix. Hello, Canada. Yeah. Thrilled just to be able to tell kids and, and especially moms and dads that their kids can play sports again is, is just such a relief. Uh, I've never done more paperwork in my life, but a special shout out, I guess, to uh, all my staff of volunteers that work their butt off to, to get these kids back on the field. So they kick off uh, later this week and I've had athletes from three different provinces or in the, in the States, as they say, States, three different regions of Canada that are going to drive in some of them over five hours every Sunday, just to, just to train, just to get back onto the field. So really excited to, uh, to announce that this week. What have you been up to on your side? Yeah, busy week in the rugby world. Let me start off with Major League Rugby. So Eddie Jones recently has been announced that he's going to consult for the San Diego Legion. And that is fantastic, you know, to have a young league here in the U.S., have somebody of his capability and rugby IQ. He'll be working with former USA Sevens and McAbee legend Zach Test. I think that's just just excellent for rugby here in North America. Got to watch the North versus South clash in New Zealand. Absolute barn burner. Carl Tanana, our favorite commentator, was on the call there as well. And then for me personally, coming up this week, September 10th, I'm delivering a Facebook, YouTube live live chat about broadcasting for rugby texas and that's installment two of three which is which is pretty cool the other news i suppose not as great is kanaloa hawaii will not be joining major rugby in 2021 so robin we have to put our beach towels away until another season when they do join you know so that holiday has been shut down well shout out to, to jack breen who's done a lot of work behind the scenes and he continues to tirelessly uh, try and grow the game across the islands and it's just a matter of time before uh, before they uh, former pro team in one of the pro leagues that's lucky enough to join them and and uh, I wish them well and I think it's going to be a real beacon for Pacific Island nations to get a professional team based in Hawaii and so close to that American market so I can't wait to support that program. Absolutely agree being a Pacific Island nations compete at the top level is what we definitely need and I think they may even join Super Rugby or another competition before they even join Major League Rugby so congrats to Jack and those guys I know there's something big coming soon and we can't wait to find out. Uh, let's switch across to thank yous and shout outs. Uh, what do you have from us on that side? A couple of athlete shout outs. Matt, Matt Klimchuk, he's a Saskatchewan boy that uh, started rugby four or five years ago. And he went to St. Michael's University to train and play with the, the, the infamous Ian Heidley uh, last year for grade 12 and graduated with honors. And uh, he's just arrived on Vancouver Island to start at the University of Victoria and follow uh, you know, a number of national team athletes. I think there's a, that's Gareth Reese, actually, one of our guests. He, he attended there. And then another young man from Eastern Canada that's on the junior national team alongside Matt is Reese Patterson, one of the most talented uh, young fly halves in the world, world rugby. And uh, just thrilled thrill to welcome them on the island. And then I have two... Uh, two athletes from the prairies that are out of my program uh, that are that are moving in and uh, today I'm actually picking up Luke Sheck that's going to follow Matt's steps rather and, and play for the infamous uh, Ian Heidley at St. Mike's and then uh, of course Carissa Norston we uh, gave her sister a shout out a couple weeks ago she's uh, she's attending the the Lindenwood Lions program with Billy Nicholson and uh, the younger sister Carissa is arriving on Vancouver Island and she's one of the brightest talents in, in Canadian rugby to come through. So remember that name and uh, just, just so happy to have these uh, athletes that are from the prairies where I've been coaching them and I, now I get them back on the island to get working with them on your side. Yeah, so we really want to thank Gary Gold. Episode 9 has gone down like the winning lottery ticket. Just such great support, particularly from our North American listeners and South African ones. 
Our second shout out has got to go out to Nolly Waterman. She officially announced she retires from all rugby this past week. She was our guest on episode two and England rugby featured a video of her scoring an 85 meter try where she beat every single player. I think it was against Canada. Um, I think it was it US. Was, I don't know. Was I, yeah. US. I, I Either way, remember. she was just, you know, like an electric eel on that side. Then a couple other cool things happening for us is Yeti. Brilliant work with their branding of our Rugby Hive logos on some of their coffee mugs, some of their wine coolers, some of their bags. I just love their, love their kit, love their stuff. So go to yeti.com and grab your things there. And then we're going to be having a competition this week for our friends in South Africa. It's called Spider Pig Wines. Not all superheroes are human is their slogan. Good friend of mine, David Wibley, and his business partner, David Nell, started this brand about five years ago. And our listeners in the Republic stand a chance to win a selection of six bottles of vino. And all they have to do is follow us on social media. They follow Spider Pig Wines on social media and share our competition post with their own fans and friends. And that'll enter them to the competition. And on Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern, this Friday, we'll announce the winner who will get those six bottles of wine. And Dave Wibbs is always trying to bring home the bacon. Him and I went to Ronnebosch Boys High School together and you've got to taste this, these wines. We're going to get them in North America sometime soon. Can't wait to share his, uh, his vino there. Spiderpigwines.com is the website. And in the words of David Brent, I feel a little bit tipsy. So make sure to follow us at Rugby Hive on Twitter and Facebook and at My Rugby Hive on Insta. And it's time now for episode number 10. It's a brilliant welcome to Joel and Reese. And thank you so much for joining us on the Rugby Hive. Uh, absolute honor to have you guys on. Let's start uh, with you, Reese, in Canada. How are things going during yeah. this uh, crazy time, my friend? Well, yeah, it's a bit, a bit crazy. I've got to be honest, I feel a bit blessed to be in this part of the world when, uh, when you have to be at home a lot. And, and uh, it's, it's scary times and thoughts with a lot of good rugby people around the world. But uh, we're getting through it. I've got eight, nine-year-old boys. So I'll become a school teacher again, but uh, but we're getting through it, and um, yeah, it's an interesting time to say the least. Yeah, exactly. And Joel, you and I have chatted, but before you were doing some obstacle courses in your house. Um, but give us some <laughs> of the positives uh, during during this time, my friend. Well, I think Africa has its own sort of heartbeat and own way of going about things, doesn't it? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of debate about whether we're approaching this coronavirus story in the in the right way, and uh, the debate is ongoing. I think the jury's still out. But what has definitely happened in, in the last couple of weeks is we've seen a massive groundswell of support for those who are hungry, those who are in need, and uh, everyone's chipped in. And, and, and there's some really great stories happening behind the scenes to feed the needy and, and, uh, and just play your part in society. You know? So as, as much as it is tough and as much as our economy is taking a proper backing, I suppose like all the economies around the world, there is, there is a little bit of groundswell, some really good groundswell around, around people uniting around this uh, this virus, it's, it's, it's tough and it's going to get harder for us, but you, know, you got to try to find the silver lining. 100%. Just trying to tell the story of, of both of you behind the scenes. So, Gareth, I know most of your career growing up, but just uh, how did you get started out in sports? I know your dad uh, probably coached everything, but what were some of the other sports you played growing up? I played everything, get my hands on. I love sport. Both my parents were school teachers and uh, um, P and sport was a big part of their life. Uh, dad played professional soccer, was signed with Chelsea, played, was a very good rugby player as well. Um, so it was a big part of my life and um, it was my community really. They were first generation Canadians and came here in the 60s. Um, no other family or blood family or friend, but the rugby club and the field hockey club became my family. So big part of my life and uh, I loved it. I was really well coached, not just technically, but on good experiences and, and um, you know, the values of the game. And rugby came late because I was in Canada. I never actually played ice hockey, which every other kid did here. But I got my hands on basketball, soccer ball, did a lot of track, whatever I could, and, uh, and just loved it. So um, very much a Canadian boy when I went off to try and prove myself in the rugby world. But, uh, but backed up well by a good, good experience as a kid here in, in Western Canada. What did that look like for you growing up in South Africa, Joel? Yeah, very similar. I think, um, you know, almost a parallel type journey. Both my parents played provincial hockey and uh, they were both competitive. And so we, as kids, grew up on the side of the hockey field with a hockey stick in our hands. Not ice hockey, Gareth, but outdoor hockey on, <laughs> on the old grass and gravel pitches, and, uh, uh, but always with the ball. And I think when we got to school, it, initially it was, it was soccer because that's what you played when you were really young. And as soon as we could, we played cricket and rugby. And, and I grew up playing predominantly cricket and, and, and rugby. And actually, I mean, you, you Darren, you know my... My, my my background at at Rondebosch Boys High. So, if I hadn't um, maybe left Rondebosch, I think my focus, Dylan, might have been 
more cricket oriented than, than rugby, but I, I switched schools and went to a rugby school and it became more rugby focused. But uh, as, as, as Reese's pointed out, you know, parents who nurtured us in sport, who taught us the, you know, the, the right way to go about things, the right approach, and, uh, and, and obviously instilled a, a, a culture of wanting to win and be the best you can. And Gareth, what are some things you'd say, I guess, to your boys and, and their friends and some other aspiring Canadian athletes out there that, that want to want to play for Canada one day and want to have a lifelong love of sport like you? Well, obviously, as Joel's alluded to, the results and, and the performance, you got to work as hard as you can. Um, you got to be smart. Um, don't be afraid to invite some input into your performance side of things. But overwhelmingly, and, and you know, one of the nice things about having some success in, in sport and meeting famous people from other sports, the, to me, there's a common thread. They're really the very best. That They're all good people. And they're, they're genuinely people that, um, that respect the game, they respect their opponents. And um, sometimes in North America, we lose that. And I think sometimes in rugby of late, we, we lose some of those values. So I genuinely, it's not just me saying the right thing. I genuinely take from the game, especially rugby, because we do such a good job of it, you know, respect uh, for the game and, um, and the values underlying it all. And it served me pretty well. And um, I hope I'll pass it on to my young boys. And Joel, when you first uh, started training with the Springbok side, what was uh, how were you treated with some of the senior players when you were the new kid on the block? So, so you know, South Africa had been in isolation for some time, Robin. So we, you know, we had a whole different scenario when we came through the ranks. It was, um, it, it was elements of of probably more of the youngster being, you know, almost mistreated and, and abused. And we had these really tough initiation processes, and it involved getting your your ass whipped and tanned and then having to sing and, mm. and drink and down, down, you know, so it, it was quite tough. But um, at the end of the day, if, if you've set your mind on something and, you, you know, you want to be there and it's, it's one of the little hurdles you got to get over and get through. Well, gents, listen, let's get right into it, right? The head to head. This is what it's all about. Let's go back to the Battle of Butterasmus, as it was called. Pool fixture between Canada and South Africa during Rugby World Cup 95. Both of you played in that match. Risi, can you paint the picture during the, what was the build up to that game like and what did that mean for Canada uh, and rugby North America playing the hosts? Yeah, well, I'll go right back, actually, and Joel's alluded to it a bit there. Everyone forgets that total isolation for us in South Africa as a country, as a people, and also as a rugby nation. We never played them. Um, obviously, the apartheid in North America was, was, it was black and white, excuse the pun, but there was no contact. We didn't even have a few players coming over. Christian Stewart was the only South African rugby player I'd really ever met. So it was quite remarkable for a bunch of Canadians to be down there. So ov- overall, I mean, obviously, the, the, talk about the Battle of the Boat and everyone, uh, the, the fight is, is uh, you know, is infamous. But, but our experience of being there was quite remarkable. I mean, Clint Eastwood, I thought, did a fairly good job of it in, in the movie, in Invictus, and Joel in his short shorts and, and the boys. I genuinely, for, for us, that was our, our initial thing. We, we were in a country no one had ever been to, nobody. And um, it, was, it was amazing how the country was, not only did it transform, as, as Eastwood portrayed in the movie accurately, over those two, three weeks leading up, but they received the world and received a bunch of Canadians. Um, and it was just a great off-field experience. Obviously, it was our third pool game, and uh, uh, you know that that had happened. We lost to Australia. We didn't went down early in the first twenty minutes. We went down seventeen points, I think, and I think we beat them for the the last three quarters of the game, and then we beat Romania well. So we were we were a funny side. We hadn't really found our identity, and uh, it's part of it came through in that final third pool game, in South Africa. But uh, but awesome experience. We were in Port Elizabeth for the all three pool matches. And that was another big factor that we really got adopted by the community and we felt good and we felt at home there. Joel, for you, this this was your final pool match before the historic first ever quarterfinal for the Springboks. What was your memories in the build up to that game? So firstly, um, you know, Gareth touched on, on Christian Stewart. I want to just tell you, I played a lot with Christian Stewart. What a great character and what an asset he was to, to Canadian oh, yeah. rugby. And when I first moved from Natal to Western Province, he was uh, the one of the centers in the, in the back line there. And, him and I didn't get on because he, he was he's such a controlling guy. He wants to call the moves and do the kicks and tell you what to do all the time. And I said, no, listen, buddy, that's, that's my job. So we, we clashed a bit. But um, what, a, what a wonderful character to have um, shared time with him, Reese. is really cool. What a legend. What a great guy and great stories around him. I shared a room with him on a couple of tours as well. It wasn't easy, but, um, but certainly entertaining. For us, the, the pool stages, you know, we trained for six or eight months to, to play Australia in the opening game. So post beating Australia, it, was, it wasn't like there was a void or there was a, a gap in our lives, like sometimes happen, almost like a post big win blues. Um, but, but we struggled to find our feet a little bit after that. We struggled against Romania in the midweek game and, uh, 
actually played quite poorly and only won narrowly. And then we got we got to Port Elizabeth and it was a chance to set the record straight. And and a few things happened that um, probably put a dampener on, on the whole affair. You know, and I think firstly the lights went out just before kickoff. Yeah. And 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 I, and I think that just meant that that with um, with us wanting to try and reestablish some form and get going again with the with with the Canadians wanting to finish the pool stages on a high, we all we all sat in the change room there and and anger and motivation and everything just you know brewed and eventually boiled over and when when we eventually did get out into the field it, it it got a little bit messy unfortunately it is the nature of the game and it does boil over sometimes and it's a physical contest um, and and unfortunately we don't see too many of those scenes anymore thank goodness. Well, speaking of the boiling over, let's go to you, Reese. I've known you for 10 years or so. Uh, we've been involved with the commentary and that sort of thing. You're such a well-behaved and just polished, wonderful gentleman. <laughs> what set you off during that match? Um, well, I didn't start it by any means, but I'll, I'll go to Joel's point. The lights out was the most bizarre thing I've been involved in. It wasn't just sort of half an hour before kickoff. This, we'd sung our anthem. We, we'd done our cheer. We were literally ready to kick the ball to start the game. And then we were we were done. So it was a 45 minute delay, and it was it was a really strange feeling in that stadium um, when we were ready to go. And and we sensed the pressure that the the, the Bucky's were under, that they were maybe looking past us a little bit, or they were definitely you, you forget they were world champions, you know, a couple of weeks later. But there was a lot of unknowns and a lot of pressure on on these guys, and we were trying to capitalize on that. We also had a team that wasn't we didn't have a great lineup presence. We didn't have a good that strong a set piece presence. We had Rod Snow in the front row. We'd, literally scrummaged a handful of games uh, before that. So we played a, a kind of a crazy, maniacal kind of game designed. We didn't kick the ball off the, off the park for, for penalties or like that. We, we, we tap and put bombs up, and we were just trying to get the game frantic. We were athletic. We knew they were a much better set-piece side than us, much more, many more weapons than us, and we wanted to keep the game ball in play. I think it's one of the highest ball-in-play games for the, for the tournament, that one. So that was kind of the, the on-field context. In the end, uh, we felt it was a pretty dirty game, and I don't think the, the, the Springboks were that comfortable with how we were trying to play them and vice versa. I'll, that was said diplomatically. Do you like that, Joel? That was my commentary. Uh, I thought it was really well handled, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we had a tough, tough pack, as most Canadian packs were, uh, and backs for that matter. And Scott Stewart, our fullback, had been dumped on his head. He would have been removed from the field. Um, and then I bowled over after that. One of the things that Captain I had said, is, and I always said this, but we had to stick up for each other as Canadians. Didn't matter what the scoreline was. Didn't matter who the opposition was. Um, you got to back each other up. And that's basically how I got sent off. I was uh, sticking up for, I think it may have been Joel's replacement, Henny LaRue. I, in my books, pop up the cheap shot in, and I reacted to that, and, and it kicked off. But um, we were a tight team, as most Canadians team were, were um, and we stuck together, and the boys didn't take a back seat. Reese, I've seen you move these days, but gee, back, back then you were quick, <laughs> eh? Wow, I um, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't have expected it. Now, Joel, listen, there's a, there's a very interesting positive story to come out of that game after that match, right, uh, for South Africa as a nation. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so, so it's interesting, Reese, you touched on it. You know, I wasn't on when uh, all the drama unfolded. I'd taken a bash on the eye and um, had some stitches above the eye and, in fact, had a cut in the eye, which meant I, I missed the quarterfinal as well with the, the gash on the actual eyeball, which was quite, quite nice. I actually wore a, 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 like a mask for, for about 12 days to protect the eye. It was, but... but um, yeah, so there was there was good that came out of it from our perspective because up until then we'd been a 100% white rugby team. Chester Williams had withdrawn from the Rugby World Cup um, a few, you know, just when the selection was made with a torn hamstring. Um, and with uh, Peter Hendricks being sent off and sent home, it uh, gave Kitch Christie the opportunity to bring Chester back in. And 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 it was great for us for a whole lot of reasons. You know, we look at Sio Kalisi in, in the last World Cup, you know, his leadership and, and the fact that he's united a, a country, um, his role in uniting a country was, was so massive. Chester was iconic in this country in that era, you know, in that period. He was, he was, he was the golden child with his... He was called the pearl because he had these pearly white teeth. He was always smiling. He was always happy. He was always, you know, playing with great heart and determination. He wasn't the biggest guy on the field. He probably wasn't the fastest winger that ever graced the fields, but he had great determination and he was a great example for all of us in the way he went about things. And to for him to come back into the team was um, was just sensational. You know, we had a slogan: "One team, one country," and uh, and that just helped add add. To, to Reese's point about how the country united around a sports team and how we went on to great things, it, it certainly helped, you know, Madiba's job, Nelson Mandela's job, 
um, it made it a lot easier to unite a nation around a team that now all of a sudden had a black hero in the team. And who went on to score four tries against uh, Samoa as well. I mean, that must have yeah. been so amazing, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, what a what a great story to to come into the World Cup and in your first game back, um, you know, score four tries, which I think only a handful of players had ever done, maybe two or three players that only ever done before that. Um, absolute legend. And it wasn't just four tries. It was, you know, a try on the other side of the field. It was into the corner. There were four unbelievable tries. Yeah, exactly. Now, Joel, you and I met Rugby World Cup last year in Japan. We commentated many pool games together. But one evening you said to me, hey, there's an event honoring the late great Chester Williams. Come along yeah. to that. And that was very special, you know, for me growing up, watching you guys, watching the Springboks, knowing the story about Chester. But the audience listening here, can you give us a bit of insight into that evening? Yeah, so Chester was approached, um, I don't know, probably... Well, bearing in mind where we are now, probably two years ago by a group who wanted to um, do something with him and use his image and make him a partner in, in a beer company. And, uh, and, and, and he actually said to these guys, because he was a very religious guy, Chester, he said, no, he doesn't want to be attached in any way to have his brand attached to alcohol or, um, or, or, or any form you know, of, um, of anything that is uh, outside of his ethical view. And so he, he turned it down. And the guy said to him, well, what about if we, you know, we launch a beer for Rugby World Cup and we donate all the proceeds to charity? And he said, okay, based on that, on, on those conditions, he'll, he'll put his name to it. And, and, and then sadly, Chesi had, you know, a massive heart attack and passed away before it ever came to fruition. So the guys who were doing this for charity, who were doing it for a great cause, decided to continue the journey. And, uh, and, and obviously, you know, Chesie left some issues at home. And part of that journey was to, to, to be very charitable, but also to fund um, his children's education. And, you know, we were privileged to be invited to go to that launch. And there were some big spenders there in, in Japan who were, you know, marketing the beer and, and, and driving funds into the charity. And, and, and to support Chesie and to support his family post Chesie and to, to support a great cause, I mean, what, what a privilege to be there. No, very special moments in time. Yeah, Darren, very, if I can just add too, like, you know, he became a good friend after that, uh, Chesie. Um, if any small way the Canadians contributed by starting to punch up, that put him on the world stage, you know, we'll, we'll take that. <laughs> but, um, but being at, at the last World Cup and seeing Khaleesi be the first captain against Canada and, and being spending time with that gentleman, I mean, what a great story he is. And you got you got to think that without Chester, that, that pathway isn't there and he doesn't stand up there and, and do what he did in the last World Cup. So, but a, a true gent as well off the field, and uh, and a sad loss to our game. Just that whole World Cup is was life changing for South Africa and and for our game. So it's pretty special that both of you were involved in that in that epic game and that uh, that World Cup. Gareth, outside of those crazy scenes versus the spring box, what were one of your favorite memories from the 95 World Cup? Well, that game also, it was only 20 points to nil in the end with two pushovers. And we were a side that weren't supposed to be in that game. So we, we felt our tactics, Ian Burtwell, our coach, did a good job. We mixed it up. We created some stuff. We didn't get on the board. I think I turned down three or four kickable goals, to be fair, So uh, because that was part of the strategy. So we played with the very best in the world that day and, and, and weren't embarrassed by any means and definitely stood up for ourselves. But, but definitely off the field, the, just the, the impact, um, seeing the nation. And you could sense this transformation that there was, that weren't sure. And again, I, I really, I wasn't involved in the film at all. Uh, I, got, I know Francois pretty well. I, 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 know, I don't know Matt Damon, but uh, I do think Eastwood captured that side of it, how the, how the country just sort of changed their mind. Our first day in camp with us, six security, three black ANC members, three white. And within days, it was so apparent that we didn't need them. One, we were Canadians, so no one really had a beef with us. But two, the game and the country was ready to see something happen here. And it wasn't going to be about a group attacking the Canadians on a, on a bus on the way back from training. So you could see we were living this, this change that happened. And um, it was a privilege to be a part of. We got to get out to some... Um, some townships and, and see that side of life because we weren't ignoring it. Uh, we actually set up a scholarship group for, that, that benefited a couple of players who came out and had experiences afterwards for those township athletes. So um, again, for me as a, as a young man, just, just totally market. I mean, I'd been at university in the UK again, Mikey Kirsten and Andrew Aiken, two of my teammates, uh, both province players, both great players actually. But I, I heard stories from them about what life was like in South Africa, but to actually witness it as a Canadian, I will never, um, you know, I'll never, be never be taken from me. And it was just great to see how our game contributed to, to that movement that happened. And I would call it a movement about sport, as Joel's alluded to, sport, just, just transforming all this stuff. And it's almost as though had, had Francois not lifted the cup on the final day, I think the job still would have been done. It wouldn't have been as sweet a story. It probably wouldn't have made a Hollywood movie. 
but but the job was done and, and rugby had, had provided this mm. experience for everyone. Risi, I'll, I'll go on exactly that. So I was a 16-year-old South African growing up uh, at the time in Cape Town. And uh, I told you all this story. And so uh, it was the opening game of the World Cup, 95, South Africa, Australia. For some reason, it was played on a Thursday. And we had to go to school. So back then, we all wore uniforms. I was at Ronda Bosch Boys High School. Joel said he was there, you know, a few years before. And we had to go check into the classroom. We packed a bunch of civvy clothes to change into. And then we all bolted out of the school and ran the 10 minutes to Newlands to watch the opening game. It was remarkable. But, but the story gets better because, you know, 16 years, years old, we weren't really going out drinking or doing anything like that. Now, in South Africa, the culture was to go and have a few drinks here and there. But a lot of us were focusing on our sports, our studies. But that night, after winning, we all went over to a friend's house across the road at Newlands. His name's Anton Van Sale, and he ended up playing, uh, you know, for Western Province, played for Barbarians. Joel knows him really well. We've got a bunch of good, strong brothers as well, play rugby. But anyway, we go and steal drinks out of his dad's bar, and we're all having a great time. And we're partying with South Africans of all different uh, backgrounds. And, and that was the first time I, as a young South African, realized, like, oh, this is, this is unbelievable. This is how it should be, right? And it was because of sport and because of that uh, that team winning, you know, so pretty, pretty amazing times. Joel, fast forward now, semi-final Rugby World Cup, 95 against France, yeah. more rain than we've ever seen at Durban. The helicopters are trying to push the rain off and stuff like that. The match looked like it wasn't going to take place. And if it didn't mm-hmm. take place, what would have happened? Well, we would have lost because of um, the sending off the All Blacks hadn't had anyone say talk. <laughs> we, would have, we would have been out of there. <laughs> but, 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 but Alan, you know what Louis Leitch is like. That game was always going to happen. Even if we had to play with goggles and, and a snorkel, it was... It was going to happen, you know. It, uh, there was there was just no way it wasn't going to take place, even if it had happened at t- ten o'clock that night with um, with people sweeping the field while we were playing. I mean, it was always going to take place. He would never have allowed that game not to happen, and he he was definitely in control. But boy, what a time, you know. If you think about um, torrential rain and floods, and you know, up and unders coming down from thirty or forty meters up and not bouncing, just and and you know, the one thing that was amazing is the fans, the people who were at the ground absolutely loved it they just embraced the conditions they took their shoes and socks off rolled their pants up and they, they just got on with it you know the hospitality tents were full and having a party afterwards it was it was just everyone adapting to the conditions and having a great time oh, i love love those memories that come such a close one against france so let's let's fast forward now we'll go to current day uh, japan last year we spent a lot of time and joel you're one of the fittest people that i've ever met how did you so get is into that, is that joel you were speaking to there <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't sure <laughs> well, listen, I'll quickly go back. Risi, so your highlights your highlights came on. So I was commentating with you, I think, Vancouver Sevens one year, and uh, Rugby Canada put out your highlights from back in the day. And I was watching this going, wow, that fly-off is very quick and brilliant. Who is that? I was like, he looks familiar. And then I was like, oh, that's Risi. Because I honestly didn't see you playing live as many times. Watch the World Cup 95, obviously. But uh, boy, I don't know what happened to you for the last 10 years. <laughs> I moved pretty quickly to get a punch in on Henny. But Joel, listen, how did you get into your, your competitive cycling and, and all the endurance activities that you do? Yeah, so I, I was asked, I mean, I've, I've, I was a corporate animal for a while. And, uh, and I mean, I didn't put on, I put on maybe since I stopped playing maybe three or four kilograms. And I was phoned one day by Ilana Mayer. I don't know if you know who Ilana Mayer is. She's a South African middle distance athlete who won silver at the Olympic Games a few years ago. She phoned me and she was running this charity. She said, do you want to um, maybe do this thing called the Cape Epic for charity? I said, you know, what is it? She said, oh, it's a little mountain bike race. I said, sure, I'll, I'll do it. So I could probably do a little bit of training and, you know, maybe lose a little bit of weight and uh, I'll take on the challenge. So, so I accepted the challenge. And then on, the, on Sunday, in the Sunday Times, I saw this little clip on the side saying, Stranskia agrees to do Cape Epic for charity. I thought, shit, I best actually have a look and see what this thing is. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an eight-day mountain bike race through the most arduous countryside of the Western Cape. Um, torturous. And, uh, uh, I mean, it was, my first one was, was absolute hell. But, but it, um, it started me on the journey, and uh, it's become a bit of a drug and a, and, a, and a proper good habit in my life. And, in fact, probably more so a lifestyle. And from there it became, you know, a couple of other challenges, Ironman. And in recent times, it's all been it's all been for a great cause. I set up a charity and I raise money for for the kids of this country, and we do some really good things. Wonderful, wonderful, Joel. Gareth, you were uh, you were inducted in the World Hall of Fame in 2011, not to mention a handful of other <laughs> and other Hall of Fames, both nationally, locally across uh, Western Canada. And being a small town Vancouver Island boy from Cowichan, I grew up, you know, watching you. And uh, as much as Dallin may have only seen you 95. I think I watched all your games. So it uh, inspired me to go, want to go to UVic and, and, and become a goal kicker. So uh, 
of all those acc- accolades, like what does that mean for you growing up in Victoria and, uh, you know, looking back on it? Well, the World Rugby Hall of Fame as the Canada Sports Hall of Fame, both huge for me. Obviously, I'm very proud. And I, I mentioned my family was um, involved in sport and, and great for my family who had supported me. But ultimately, that is really about that group of guys that didn't take a back seat that I referenced earlier that stuck together, that team that went on the world stage and, and beat Tier New tier one nations pretty regularly that, you know, right before that 95, we'd beaten France, we'd beaten Wales in Cardiff, you know, these, these are proper victories. So uh, I, I look at it. I was the goal kicker and I was maybe the, uh, the face of that effort um, in some ways, but that recognition is about those, that group of guys that came from nowhere that had the wrong accents at that time in world rugby um, that did no one expect anything from. And, and they banded together and, and showed the world what Canadian rugby could be all about. So I'm very, very proud of that. And um, if it took, you know, the goal kicker getting, uh, getting an accolade to, to, to recognize that story, then so be it. Um, but I, I'm proud of, uh, of, of being a part of that group. Yeah. In many ways as well, though, you were also, you know, our, our dark horse that went over and played professionally overseas <laughs> And, uh, you know, you hear in Dallin's story when he was growing up in Cape Town and watching those guys, it was, it was the same for me. But part of, part of why, you know, I, I had this idea to connect with Dallin and tell these stories is all the athletes in this day and age, we know all their stories. We see, we see most of the stories. But for those other young kids out there, we want to we tell the stories of the legends like yourself. So I think it's really important to tell the stories and of a time when, when we, you know, we had that attitude that we could beat anybody. Yeah, I think we still got the attitude. I think it's just a lot tougher. The world of rugby is tougher. But I, uh, I was very much wanted to prove myself as a Canadian. You know, went over to Europe, played club rugby against Joel, and all the great fly halves of the world. You know, Michael Lina, Rob Andrew, Johnny came along after that. Wilkinson. So that I, I knew I wanted to be out there showing everyone that I could, uh, that I could do it. And uh, and I loved, love the journey. I got to chip in there. That that um that Canadian team that one in Wales and then uh, did so well at, at, at Rugby World Cups. It was, it was, it was iconic, really. It was the start of a great journey and, and so well led and so well, so well marshaled. And, and, you know, to, to come from a low base and, uh, and achieve as much as that team did is a sensational achievement. And, and really, Gareth, you know, you were a huge part of it. And, 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 and obviously, which is why we all have so much respect for your punch against Henny as well as all the stuff <laughs> on the field. <laughs> No, really, it, it's, uh, it, it was a great journey that you were part of, and you should be very proud. Yeah, great group of guys. Unfortunately, we've lost a few. I should give Norm Hadley a shout-out here, our, our enormous second row. A fantastic presence off the field. We lost him, and I know Joel's lost some teammates. Quite hard for me to believe, you know, that, we, that we've lost James and Chester and catching a few of those guys. It's just, uh, I guess it means we're getting old, but it's, it's really sad. But great memories. All right. Well, another head-to-head. Reese, you played against uh, played against Joel with the Wasp, and he was playing for the Leicester Tigers. How was that battle back in the day, playing playing in Europe? Well, Leicester, they were the hardest team to play against, and uh, it was a tough tough ground to play at. And uh, but we had a great side. We had a good club side. I'm not sure I didn't play center that day. I had to move over at one point, and we had some injuries. But um, I don't remember the details. But I think it was pretty much a saw off Leicester and, and Wasp. Uh, that was what, 90, 96, 97, 98, that kind of time? So, Robin, I'll tell you, it was always hard playing against Wasps because uh, they, they, had, they had a good side. We had a great side at Leicester. We had a lot of the England players, a couple of Irish players, real formidable pack of forwards, fast, you know, decent back line. Um, but Wasps at the time they had, had Reese, they had Lawrence Delalio, they had a couple of really great players, also highly competitive. In fact, I think in maybe in 98, you guys beat us at, at Welford Road, if I remember correctly. I'll tell you what was the worst thing of all was when Reese moved to number 12 because then I had to tackle him and <laughs> uh, defend against him and he was flipping running in at pace. Yeah, that was the goal. Twyford Avenue was a tough place to play. That was a, a big victory. I know Lawrence Delalio, you know, a very proud Englishman and up against Martin Johnson, probably the two iconic English players of their era. I mean, Lawrence would get so up for those games uh, and uh, as our club did because they, they kind of set the standard a little bit before that. And um, yeah, great battles. And English... Uh, Premiership at the time was awesome because literally the best players in the world, as I said, Michael Lina was down the road at Saracens with Francois. The best players in the world were there in, in England. Every week it was it was great to meet up with these guys and and have good battles. So let, let's uh, switch across both of you. You've done commentating for a decade or more. Um, Risi, let's start with you. What do you love about that role and being so close to the game in that form of it? Well, initially I like that. I believe I understand the game, whether it's sevens or fifteens or women's or, or kids. I mean, I understand the game. So there's nothing worse than someone who doesn't really get the game trying to provide their insight. But the, overwhelmingly for me, having grown up in North America and, and Robin alluded to it, we didn't get a lot of attention or coverage. 
um, being able to tell the stories, whether it's American or Canadian players or other nations on the uh, on the HSBC World Series, being able to tell their story accurately and provide some insight into the journey of these athletes, that's always inspired me to do my to do my research and do it properly. And you know, once you get to work with some of the greats, um, Keith Quinn was a huge influence on me to get to to see him at work. The man's been to 12 Olympics, I believe. I mean, it was just some of those guys, uh, just their knowledge of the game and their understanding. I know what the, the style of commentating has changed, but I love the fact that you can tell an accurate story. I took the responsibility very seriously to tell those athlete stories properly, and I still do. And uh, yeah, I, I feel it's a privilege to be one of a couple of people who's reporting uh, on the efforts of 30, uh, 30 people on the field. And what I will say, would re- really impressive, uh, Reese, is that you switch so easily to first voice, which I know you're more familiar with on the Sevens World Series. But how do you enjoy that experience? Because normally being an analyst or color, it's a diff- completely different role. Yeah, well, it's, it, it is a craft. I've got some young players that are taking an interest here. But, um, you know, the, the pictures tell the real story. That's you, you try and add something to it. Um, and identify some people in the first voice role. But in the second voice role, you want to add to why things are happening. You know, Joel's just alluded to having to mark a, a big man from the, from the 10 jersey over in the 12 hole. You know, those are things that the average punter doesn't always realize at home. Um, and uh, and you also, also you see a lot off the ball sometimes as, as, a, as an ex-player that you maybe can bring to it. You can even help the director. But uh, no, I just, I just, rugby, there's so much going on. Uh, I know in North American sports, it's, it can be quite formulaic. Because if it's gridiron, there's downs or basketball, there's a, there's a time clock. But but rugby, it's it's an art. You can get some dud games. Don't get me wrong. And that's where some of the great commentators learned their craft. You know, Bill McLaren, the, the the Scotsman. You know, he's doing Hoyk versus Kelso in the rain on a Wednesday night for rugby special. There's not much going on in the mud. You know. Um, so they learned to tell a few stories, but uh, it's it's been a, a privilege for me. And Joel, your journey has been remarkable as well on the broadcasting side. Have you been all over the world doing it? Uh, give it give us some of your your special memories over the years. Yeah, so I think um, I mean I've been really privileged to be at, a, at almost all of the World Cups. The one I missed was the the one down in New Zealand where um, I chose not to go because I have a business here and um, I hosted a chat show here on this side rather. Yeah, my journey started in 1999. I was still playing in the UK, and I'm, in fact I just got injured, which was proved to be a career-ending injury, but Super Sport, our local broadcaster, phoned me up and said, look, you're there, do you want to come and do some commentary? And I arrived for the first game. And 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 just like um, you've mentioned a couple of names there, you see, I was uh, nurtured, mentored by the, the great Hugh Bladen. You know, he's for us in South Africa, is the, is the iconic voice of rugby. And um, what a, and, and what a wonderful man. He's become a great, great friend of mine. And we, you know, we still chat. And as much as he's getting on, we still spend time together. He's, he, he taught me almost everything I know, you know, he taught me how to put, how to get my point across. Um, and I think obviously you develop and you try and, you know, improve yourself and you prepare well. And But um, for me, it was always about trying to look at things a little differently, about trying to say, how do we add value? Greasy, you touched on it. How do we add value to the viewer to uh, maybe understand why people were doing things? And sometimes it's not the first why. It's, it's why did they do this? Why did they want to do it? What were they trying to do? Why did it go wrong? Why did it work? Why didn't it work? You know, just trying to add some some real value and some real insight. And I think as a color, you don't always get to tell the stories and give the background, but but it becomes even more important then to add tremendous value in terms in terms of the storyline of what is unfolding out there on the field in front of you. It's um, for me, it's it's I do it because I I just love being involved in the game. I love being at the games. You, I mean, to Reese's point, there's some real dud games we've got to do every now and then. But uh, generally, it's such a privilege to go to a test match or go to a big super rugby game or go to a rugby world cup and be part of this this wonderful game, some form or another. We would never give it up. It's just, it's in our DNA. You're, you're so right. Uh, it's the best seat in the house, you know, if you can't play. Joel, I had a real uh, brilliant experience working with you. It was such an honor in uh, in Japan. And let's go into one of those games. Canada played the Springboks for the first time since yeah. rugby in a World Cup since 95. And I was prepping, doing something at the at the top of the booth. And I looked down and I saw this big frame and it was Reese. And you were chatting to him there. No punches thrown this time? Well, you know what what happened between the four lines in Port Elizabeth stayed on the field in Port Elizabeth, you know. And uh, I think that's the great thing about this game, you know. What, um, and, it, and it's not just, you know, that battle of butch. You know, you can think back on many other games where there's been incidents and punches and rivalries. Um, and, and the nature of the game is about respect. It's about... It's about, you know, the characters, the friends you make. It's about the values of the game itself. And, and I think that's what makes us all friends, you know, post-rugby. Post and a, a rugby friend, 
is a is a friend for life. You you know you might not I might not see Reese for you know three or four years and see him at the World Cup and and it's just wonderful to catch up and uh, to share a moment and share a laugh and talk about this great game. But it is the game that has made us friends, that has brought us together, that you know we share this 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 great thing in common, whether it's the values plus the the passion and. Uh, and, and enables us to live this journey onwards forever and ever. And Reese, you, you've switched jerseys, right? You guys uh, uh, during 95? Uh, yeah, since uh, we do, I have Joel's jersey. I'm just cleaning out my basement. I just found this, um, bizarre enough. And I'm, Joel's jersey is down there somewhere. Uh, was at Andy Aiken's house for five years because he did the laundry for me after that game. Um, and Joel, <laughs> I know, Joel, I know, has my jersey and uses it for camping every summer. <laughs> Yeah, the whole family goes out and sleeps under it, under the stars. So, 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 so Rishi, I'll tell you something. I, I, I do still have your jersey. It's in, uh, it's in my cupboard here, just down the passage. I don't have my jersey from the final, but I've got yours from that game, from the pool game. There you go. Yeah. yeah, what did you get for your jersey from the final? I didn't see it. Uh, we, we moved house a couple of times, and it actually, it got pretty removed. It got redistributed. Go. But, uh, no, and, and I just to reiterate there, I mean, we met up again at this World, World Cup. Part of my excitement is, and, and we saw it with Khaleesi and Ardon, the two captains on the day, you just hope they have the same experience that we've had, that they can have a friendship, and they can be talking about a football match 25 years later like we are. I mean, I, I genuinely am excited for this group of players that they, they will get that. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, we've, we've been pretty lucky. And uh, there's some real characters in the game. I hope the characters don't leave the game. That's, that's one of my fears. That they don't become robots. Do you know the other thing? Um, we, we have COVID-19 and this virus going around. But I'll tell you, if it weren't for that, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation, you know. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a little silver lining. It's taught us to just, you know, appreciate the planet, appreciate our friendships, appreciate our family a little bit more maybe to do things a little bit differently. And uh, this type of engagement is, is, is wonderful. We, we probably, Reese, we wouldn't have done this if it weren't for the virus, you know? So uh, this is a great positive in some ways. Well, Reese's never up at 9 a.m. That's why he's complaining. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not on Saturdays, yeah. If it keeps going on, I'm going to be down there to drink some of that wine behind you. <laughs> oh, you're more than welcome. Anytime. Anytime. There's a guest suite down the passage. Anytime you want. Well, that's why we, why we started this. So I don't sit still like, like you guys. I'm always on the road coaching. And uh, one of the initiatives I've started is driven by my athletes across Canada and actually across the U.S., Argentina, and Mexico is athletes and parents reaching out. What can I do for my kids? They're, they're going crazy. And so just putting together plans. So I've organized just over now a hundred athletes and coaches. And we jump on a, we jump on a zoom call once a week and we do some goal setting and, uh, and then it's really athlete driven and they share in the groups. And we've got, we've got farm kids in the middle of Canada to girls that play for the, the Pumas team in Argentina. And uh, so a lot of, a lot of my listeners are, are, are young athletes and for them on the call, it's, I, I think one of the untapped things for us, Gareth is, is your kicking prowess and, and, and why we haven't picked your brain enough, but uh I just want to talk to you about goal kicking and, and for those young kickers out there, it's typically lonely. It's much like a golfer. You're either a hero or a zero. So just, just what words of advice do you have for young goal kickers, men and women across, uh, across the globe? Well, I honestly never found it lonely. I loved it. I mean, you're alone a lot, but I genuinely loved the, the challenge. It was such a finite thing. It's one of the finite skills in rugby that you could control. Uh, and I love kicking goals. I just, uh, I remember when, when I signed with Wasps, uh, we played Loftus Road, the 20,000-person football stadium right in the middle of Shepherd's Bush in London. And I had literally the keys to the stadium, this beautiful soccer pitch and a bag of brand-new balls, and I was, I'd be kicking goals. And people would say, oh, what a sacrifice. You're, you're so committed. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I grew up on the west coast of Canada. This is a dream come true, to have a, one, to have a bag of brand-new balls. That would have been fine by me. And be <laughs> kicking goals in an empty soccer stadium. I mean, this is like – I dreamt of this as a 10-, 12-year-old boy, right? So I, I do think it's a, you have to put your time in. You've got to be honest. Set off the top. You have to be honest, and you got to – you almost have an internal dialogue. Uh, I know the sports site guys that I work with, there's, there's an element of that. you got to give yourself feedback. But you also have to be willing to step up for the moment. And that, that comes easier with time. I'm sure Joel, Joel's got some pretty big kicks in his time. Uh, whether it's a place kick or a drop goal, it doesn't come without the work going in. And, um, you know, uh, a couple of World Cups have been won on drop goals and, and the two gentlemen involved, one of them on the other end of the mic here and Johnny Wilkinson, you know, I'm pretty sure I know they put in their hours. And so this, those moments are, are the reward. They're not really the, um, the, the starting point. They're the end point. And for you, but the one thing that really defined you is your consistency. Can you talk a little about your consistency, especially at your final World Cup with all the experience? Yeah, I found I became more consistent with age. Um, as a professional player, I mean, I was an amateur for the first half of my career. So I was studying and working. So once you have more time, you can just put in more 
training time and kick more balls. And, and that is whether it's a golf swing or, or a place kick, it doesn't matter. You just have the, the chance to be more consistent. So um, I do think mentally too, you can process it, you can isolate it. Um, and um, it became a, a closed skill. And um, yeah, you put your time and I was probably a better goal kicker when I was 32 and retired as a pro than when I was uh, 19 and, and probably athletically, physically better. I think to add to that as well, the older you get, the, the more you know your body and you know the little kinks in your, in your body. You understand your swing. You understand when you're kicking the ball well and when you're not, when you've got to work harder, when you've got to back away. Um, I think that experience element helps enormously as a kicker. And Joel, what were some some of your mental uh, approaches when you're kicking for goal specifically? Once you're in the saddle and you're locked and loaded, what's going through your head? So, 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 I'll, so, firstly, just if I can backtrack a second there. So, so I think um, I think I have a slightly, slightly different view to Gareth. I think you do become more comfortable as you get older, but it's because you just understand yourself a little bit better. But I think as a kicker. You um, just like a golfer, it's very it's, there's very few sports where you stand over a ball and you have time to think about it. And I think the ability to block out the pressures and the thought process and to focus completely on just you know one or two basic little things and execute is a it's a it's a great talent to have. And um, you can practice it for hours and hours and hours. But the only time it really comes to fruition is if you are able to do it for the big moments, which obviously we you know we were both blessed with that skill and that talent. I don't think that is something that that everyone can be taught. Some kids can be taught that, or some players can be taught that. But for many, it's uh, it's something you're born with. For me, every I just try to make every kick the same. I try to um, make my run up the same. Make it absolutely consistent. I um, I used to walk back exactly the same. I used to pick up a little grass and and a piece of grass and drop it to see which way the wind was blowing. But mainly because it was part of my concentration ritual. Um, I had a couple of words I would say in my head, and it was about the focus and about keeping my head down and following through. And uh, and then I would start my run up with a step slightly across every single one, and then you know I knew from there I was I was on the right track. It was just about making it exactly the same every single time. Those big moment kicks, uh, and I, I really believe they are sort of that's that's a big part of your job. But that is about training. To, I agree with Joel. You can I work with Dr. David Cox, who's a is a legend in sports psych. Uh, worked with all the major sports over here. Steve Nash is a big part of his success in basketball. But you can you can you can actually train in terms of what Joel's alluded to there, language, in terms of routine, um, in terms of you know process and, and outcome. So if you're kicking a goal to win a match, if you're thinking about this ball going through the post will win the match, then you're probably already doomed. You need to be thinking about the process and, and the, the process that Joel's just gone through in his head there about your leg, about your plant foot, about all the things that you do. And have done on the training pitch. If you start thinking about outcomes, then you're then you're in trouble because because uh, that's not you're not in the process at that point. Thank you both for sharing that. All right, Gareth, I, I was talking to Dallin last night about uh, just just some of your uh, some of your teaching days, and uh, you were able to coach a couple of famous uh, young princes. Can you share uh, share a little bit about that for our, our younger listeners? Uh, yeah, well, it was just before rugby turned officially professional. I'd, I'd finished my postgrad up at Oxford uh, University, and um, I was offered a job at Eaton College where I was told I would be, uh, if I came, I would be coaching the, what is for me, the grade eights, the first year, the 14 year olds. And um, I thought that was strange. You know, I was a current international player. Why wouldn't I be coaching the first 15? And it was told it would become clear to me why afterwards. And uh, obviously then soon after uh, William and, sorry, uh, Diana and, and Charles announced that William would be coming to Eaton, which was a huge thing for him as a person. I got to, to um, spend some time with him a couple of years ago when he was out here in Canada. And there's no question that Diana wanted him to go to Eaton to be as normal as he could be. You know, it's, it's a school that's actually quite public, even though they're wearing tailcoats and, 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 uh, and stiff collars. It's actually a fairly open public school. Anyways, I was there and uh, became his rugby coach um, and taught at the school. A great experience for me. Um, you know, I don't talk a lot about the specifics, but it was rarefied times, really. There was bodyguards everywhere. Again, they didn't know quite how to handle it initially. Uh, it was my first day of teaching. There were 200 photographers stacked up that I couldn't actually get to my classroom for the first lesson. It's that famous photo of, um, of William being on the front steps, I think, with uh, Charles and Diana and uh, and. Andrew Gailey's boarding house. Anyways, uh, to be a part of all that, again, this little boy from Victoria, from the West Coast of Canada, being immersed in all that and and having Prince William call me sir, um, uh, it was just bizarro. Um, but uh, again, I, I credit rugby for, for taking me there and and uh, taking me to places I never would have dreamed of. And was he any good at rugby? He was solid. He was, we had <laughs> six, he, was in, he was in the thirds, I think. He's a very good swimmer. Yeah. Great, very nice kid. One thing I always say is uh, how many 
kids do you know at 14 that know what their job is going to be definitively for the rest of their lives? And that was ultimately what their situation was, right? And even Harry, to a certain extent, they, they knew what they were going to be doing five years, 10 years, 50 years from now. And, and it, was a, it was a strange um, place to be involved. The school did a great job for them, I believe, in supporting him. And, and when she passed, which was incredibly sad, obviously, and the whole nation was more, I don't know if Joel, you were there then, but it was that talk about COVID. I mean, that was really a bizarre emotional time to be around in the UK. But when she passed, it was really nice for all of us at the school. The overwhelming feeling for the best um, welfare for the boys was to get them back to school, to get them back to an environment where they thrived, they had friends, they played sports, they were involved. Um, so that was in some way a vindication of what we were doing. But yeah, that was, you know, for me, COVID has been really eerie, the streets being empty and that kind of stuff. Um, Diana's passing was was like that as well in the UK. It was really a strange time. Well, Reese, that is a crazy journey, all possible through rugby. And now I know why they call you rugby royalty. So let's uh, move along uh, to our final question here. Can you give us a bit of insight into what things you're currently working on? And Joel, uh, we'll start with you. Give us a bit more information about the uh, the charity and the nonprofit you're working with. Yeah, so when uh, Ilana Mayer phoned me and uh, I started fundraising, I realized that um, I, I could actually, uh, it was so it was quite easy for me to raise money. So um, I, I rode the, the race with this very stupid, uh, not particularly aerodynamic, you know, luminous orange mohawk on my um, helmet. And, uh, and, and I mean, the, the kids used to call me chicken head when we were riding through, but uh, um, it, it, great, it got great attention. And from there, I launched a charity and called, a, called it the Luma Hawk Foundation. And we, our focus has always been around uh, the educational needs of underprivileged children. And, and it followed the, the thought process, the dream, the desire of Nelson Mandela to educate the nation. And obviously, most importantly, the underprivileged children. Because if, if you can give a child education and you, 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 know, you give them hope, then you, you, know, you enable them to go on in life and hopefully achieve something. So. Our latest project is about testing their eyesight and, and giving glasses to those in need. Um, and this is probably, it's been going on for about a year and a bit. It's probably a five or six year project. In fact, it, it might even go on forever, I guess. But right now, like, like all you know, charities, we're in lockdown. So we're doing things a bit differently. We're supplying food to the kids and probably 100 kids that we're supporting now you know, through lockdown and for the next month or so. So we're trying to do our bit and, you know, we, we're blessed. We're in a position, my business is strong enough to support the charity and, uh, you know, we have a lot of employees and, you know, we, 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 we do our bit. We, we try and help where we can. Wonderful to see you, Joel. And I see a lot of the social media posts and stuff like that. It's, it's brilliant, the stories that are coming through this, you know. And Reese, on your side, give us a bit more insight into what you're currently involved in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, st- I'm involved in similar causes, uh, education and sport being the ones. I work on a program called Beyond the Win. Uh, for Canada Sports Hall of Fame, which is very much about beyond the results. What do you take from sport? What are the lessons we learn? And um, and I really value that. I do think in North America, we've got very result oriented. And uh, and also there's some, some problems with kids getting access to sport, which that breaks my heart. Uh, when you see young people, whether they're or the next next Joel Scrancy or they're just a kid who wants to have a kick about, I, I do think it, it's very sad when kids don't have access to sport. So working on that, but also have the privilege of working with the, the Canadian Union uh, at the top level, uh, helping with our Sevens events. We squeaked in the uh, Vancouver Sevens uh, ahead of COVID, which has really, really helped the union and helps us grow the game. And helping our athletes heading off to the Olympics and um, and uh, in, in our growing the game in Canada. So uh, trying to put back a little, give back a little bit because the game served me bloody well and, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Oh, I love it, Reese. Well, listen, you two absolute legends. A real privilege and honor to have you on the Rugby Hive podcast. We really want to thank you for your time. Cheers, guys. Thanks for doing this, eh? Pleasure and great chatting. And most importantly, um, Reese, I said it earlier, there's a guest week down here when you do decide to come visit. <laughs> we, well, we're all yeah, coming I'm down, John. That That's <laughs> a deal. That's a deal. And there's no. plenty of wine. We'll restock by the time you get here. <laughs> exactly. Cheers, yeah, mate. it's been great, guys. Really good to catch you up, Dallin. Nice to meet you, Robin and Reese. Really good to see you, buddy. Take care, right? Look after yourselves, all of you. Stay safe. Thank you. Good to see you, Joel. Beautiful ball over top. Yes, Seppo! Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast and catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there, and we'll see you soon. They've taken the lunch money from Sunday.